Hear the word of God from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 38 through 51. This reading comes from the Common English Bible. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he asked, what are you looking for? They said, Rabbi, which is translated teacher, where are you staying? He replied, come and see. So they went and saw where he was staying and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two disciples who heard what John said and followed Jesus was Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. He led him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day, Jesus wanted to go into Galilee and he found Philip. Jesus said to him, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law and the prophets, Jesus, Joseph's son from Nazareth. Nathanael responded, can anything from Nazareth be good? Philip said, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said about him, here is a genuine Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, how do you know me? Jesus answered, before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are God's son. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. I assure you that you will see heaven open and God's angels going up to heaven and down to earth on the human one. The word of God for the world. Thanks be to God. There are a few more comforting things for a preacher than to be standing in front of a congregation knowing that they have been armed with what looks like tomatoes. <laughs> it's compounded by the fact that I know that the choir is armed with them behind my back too, which is, thanks a lot. I think next week we'll hand out rotten eggs. Wouldn't that be good? The church has been around for 2,000 years. We know it was born on the story of Pentecost. We also know that it was conceived in the story you just heard. Like all of life, it began small and grew bigger. Just like you and I began as just a single cell, it turned into two cells and turned into four and turned into 16. That's the way the body of Christ grows, one life at a time, one relationship at a time. You know, when we think about the word church, we often think about a building, don't we? Like a sanctuary, like where we're sitting now. Or sometimes we think about an address or a location like 500 West Platte. But we remember that the most basic, most essential definition of the body of Christ is that it is built not one brick at a time, not one building at a time, but one life at a time, one relationship at a time 
when one person simply invites another person with those three simple words, come and see. Those are words that John loves. When he's writing his gospel in the very first chapter, he says that phrase many, many times. It begins with Jesus saying those three words when he invited Andrew to come follow him. And then Andrew, in turn, went to Peter and invited him to experience that Jesus too. Later in the story, Jesus called a person named Philip to follow him, and Philip used those exact same three words when he went to his dear friend Nathaniel and invited him to come and see this Jesus and to watch your life be transformed, an experience of Jesus, not to save his soul from hell, that language isn't even a part of this story, but so that Nathaniel could come and meet this Jesus and have his life transformed so that he could begin to live the life that God had intended for him to live. That's the way it works. One invitation at a time, one person simply saying to another, come and see. That's the way it works. Now, think about it. If, if Philip had not invited Nathaniel, if Andrew had not invited Peter, then there would be no person on which Jesus would have built His church. And if there were no church, there would have been no early Christians. And if there were no early Christians, there would be no Christians today, which means there would be no you and me. Inviting others to come and see one person at a time. That's the way it is. The body of Jesus Christ grows through invitation. Invitation, one life at a time. Last Wednesday, I sat down with people in our current new member class. They're going to be joining next Sunday. It's always a treat for me. It's one of the highlights of my ministry to be able to sit down with the group of people who are choosing to join the membership of this church. I love to hear their stories. I love to ask them how they first found out about this church. And I love to ask them, what kept you coming back? Not just what brought you here the first time, but what brought you back for the second visit and the third and the fourth? There's one common denominator among all of the very different stories that they told. All of them could, inv could talk about one person or identify a group of people in their lives who introduced them who invited them, who told them to come and see, to come and check out the Jesus that they were experiencing in this congregation. All of them could identify at least one person. But do you know what none of their stories included? None of their stories included a person coming to them to try to keep their eternal lives out of hell. None of them had a story of a person who came and spouted Bible verses in their face until they relented. None of them had a story about a person who argued with them until they agreed on a certain set of doctrinal beliefs. None of them. See, that's, that is what American Christianity, by and large, has turned invitation into, right? A kind of salesmanship that's driven by instant conversions and keeping people out of hell. And that's turned a lot of people off. That's turned you off. It's turned me off. And I think what's happened is that the mainline church, churches like ours, have swung the pendulum so far in the opposite direction that we would prefer not to invite at all, that we would prefer to keep religion to ourselves, that we dare not talk to anybody else about church or faith or Jesus because we're concerned that we would be lumped in with those kinds of Christians except there's a problem with that, because the body of Jesus Christ grows one life at a time. That's the way it's supposed to work, one relationship at a time, one invitation at a time. That is a part of our mission. So, what I'd like to do this morning is unpack a few things for you. I'd like to give you a few insights that will help us think about invitation in a different kind of way. And the first thing is to think about our motivation. 
what really ought to be our motivation? For some Christians, their motivation is to try to keep their loved one out of hell. And if that's not part of our vocabulary, if the language of heaven and hell doesn't work for you, if the idea of inviting people to prevent their souls from eternal torment and damnation doesn't quite work for you, then what ought to be our motivation? I love the way one person said it. Rather than scare the hell out of people, we should love heaven into them. Rather than scare the hell out of people, we should love heaven into them into them. And what that means is that when we meet a new person and when we begin the process of establishing a relationship with that person, and if we discover that that person doesn't belong to a church and doesn't know Jesus, what it means is you and I have an amazing gift to offer them. We have a treasure to give to them because we have the key to help them live their life exactly the way God wants them to live. Imagine that. We have a way to give them life in Christ, because life in Christ is not simply about where we go after we die. It is about living a full life right now, to be fully in love with God and to be fully in love with other people. That's the kind of life God wants us to live, and we get to give that to other people. There is not a single person on earth There is not a single person we know who does not need that kind of gift. Augustine once said that our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God. And everyone you know, even even you yourself, knows what it's like to have that deep down restlessness. I mean, the people you know might seem to be put together on the outside, right? They might seem accomplished and perfect. They might seem to be content and driven on the outside, but the gospel reminds us that there is a deep down restlessness to our spirit, a restlessness in our souls that will not be calmed until it discovers life in Jesus, until it experiences God's love. Shouldn't you want that for the people you know? Shouldn't you want that for yourself? Shouldn't you want that for the people you love? Not to keep them from going to hell, but so that they can have a restlessness free life, a life that God wants them to live. Shouldn't you want that for others? Penn Gillette is the verbal half of the world famous magician duo Penn and Teller, and he's also an outspoken atheist. He once told a story of a fan who came up to him after a show, and they struck up a very friendly conversation. And then during the course of that brief chat, this fan began to talk to Penn Jillette, this atheist, about Jesus. And listen for the remarkable way that Penn Jillette described their encounter to an interviewer. It was really wonderful, he said. I believe he knew that I was an atheist, but he was not defensive, and he, and he looked me right in the eyes, and he was truly complimentary. It didn't seem like empty flattery. He was really kind and nice and sane, and he looked me in the eyes. And then the person brought up the subject of Jesus, and he began to talk to Penn Jillette about his faith. And Penn's reaction to this fan in this interview was remarkable. Because rather than disparaging the guy for bringing up his faith, Penn actually praised him. This is what he said in the interview. He said, if you really believe, if you really believe that you have something that could benefit the life of someone else, that could help them experience true life, He said, quote, how much do you have to hate somebody not to reach out to them? He said, I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a key to life or whatever, and you think that it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward, or atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize would say, just leave me alone and keep your religion to yourself, 
How much do you have to hate somebody not to invite them? I find that remarkable. I mean, if an outspoken atheist understands the value of Christians inviting others, then come on. What excuse do we have? I love the way Guy Kawasaki describes it. Guy Kawasaki is the former marketing guru with the Apple Corporation. He, in part, is responsible for the remarkable turnaround of the Apple company in the mid-1990s, and I particularly love the title of his position. On his business card, Guy Kawasaki said he was a, quote, Apple evangelist. That was his job. His job was to get people to fall in love with Apple, not just enough to buy their products, but to fall in love with the kind of life that Apple intended for them to live. Not to see Apple as just another computer company, but as the key to living a different kind of life, a life of comfort, a life of convenience, a life of coolness by being part of the Apple community. That's the way he described in his interview a few years ago when he was asked to explain the reason for the remarkable turnaround at Apple. This is what he said. It just happened. We didn't plan it that way. It just happened. Apple has thousands of user groups. These are truly the evangelists, he said. They're not paid. They're not employees. They tell people to use Macintosh solely for the other person's benefit. That, he said, is the difference between evangelism and sales. Sales is rooted in what's good for me. Evangelism is rooted in what's good for you. I love that. I mean, no offense to any of you who are salespeople, but <laughs> I, I love the way that an atheist magician and a marketing guru know more about why Christians should be invitational than most Christians. Because if we really believe, if we really believe that in Christ we can fully live the kind of life that God wants us to live, a life full of love for God and love for others, then why shouldn't we share that? Why shouldn't we want to invite people? Not because it's good for us, but entirely because it is good for them. And I got to tell you, of all the churches, of all the churches that you and I can be a part of, I'd like to remind us that inviting others to experience Jesus in this church, inviting other people to experience Jesus in Hyde Park United Methodist Church ought to be easy because there is a lot about this church that many people in the Tampa Bay area are looking for. And I'm not trying to disparage other churches or other denominations or the way other churches do their work, but there is something unique about Hyde Park United Methodist Church that other people are craving. They just don't know about us. I know of very few other churches, very few other churches who offer what we do, which is a balanced approach to the Christian faith because we have both an evangelical heart, and socially active hands. We have a passion for Jesus, and we have a compassion for other people, particularly those in need. We take seriously our personal spiritual practices so that we can grow deeper in our love for God, but we also take that love and we make it real for as many people across a wide spectrum as possible because on the one hand, we are Christ-centered and biblically rooted, but we are also very open to a diversity of people and a diversity of perspectives because we are warm-hearted and open-minded. In short, we love God and we love all. We love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we love everyone without exclusion, without exception, without condescension, without judgment. That's what people are looking for, and don't you think that's worth sharing? You know, at the end of the Scripture reading today, there's a remarkable ending. Did you catch it? After Philip went to Nathanael to say, come and see Jesus, Nathanael went over to see Jesus for himself. And did you catch 
what Jesus said to Nathanael. Basically said, hi, Nathanael. I know all about you. And Nathanael looked puzzled. He said, well, how? How do you know me? We've never met, have we, Jesus? And Jesus said, oh, I, I know all about you. Even before Philip invited you, I was watching you sitting there under the fig tree. I know your heart, the gospel says. And I know how genuine you are. Now, I know you better than you know yourself. Jesus knew a lot about Nathaniel. Jesus loved Nathaniel, just like Jesus knows and loves every person you know, whether they realize it or not. But there's only one thing that Jesus needed. Jesus needed a Philip to go reach out to that Nathaniel and say those three simple words, come and see. Come and see this Jesus who knows you really well and loves you. Come and see this Jesus who can teach you how to live the life that God has intended for you to live. Come and see this Jesus. And you know what? I know a really good church where you can come and see him. Will you be that Philip? Let's pray together. God, we give you thanks for this charge, for this calling, for this gift to invite other people into an experience with you. Thank you for giving us the best motivation of all to seek other people so that they can live a life of love. Help us, O oh Lord, in just our natural everyday business to reach out to those that we know, to extend a compassionate heart and an invitational hand and remind us that this is the way it works, your kingdom, your body being built one life at a time. We give you thanks for this command and for the way that's changed our lives as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As Sally is coming back up, I uh, want to celebrate uh, with all of us that she is beginning a well-deserved pastoral renewal time this week. She'll be uh, gone for uh, most for all of October, and we look forward to having her return to us with uh, energy uh, re replenished and joy renewed. And in that light, she's going to come up now to share with us some practical ways that we can strengthen our four spiritual practices of giving joyfully and generously, reading the Scripture, inviting others to Jesus, and will offer for us a model of prayer that we can experience today that we can practice throughout the week. Sally? Should I dance a jig? <laughs> so, friends, our response to God this morning involves commitment, commitment of our whole selves. As we practice the grip, as we practice those personal spiritual practices that deepen our relationship with God and one another, generosity, reading scripture, inviting others, and prayer. So I just would like to offer a few practical tips uh, for, that you could, might use this week or in the weeks to come. If you want to practice giving that is generous and joyful, then I want you to know what an impact your gift to the mission and ministry fund makes. The gifts to that, to the offering of this church, enabled a team of our youth to go on a mission trip to Costa Rica over the summer, and they shared the love of God through Vacation Bible School every day with the children there. Those children's lives were changed, our youth's lives were changed, and this offering goes to support programs like that, and you can give to that anytime. You can do it by texting, by going online, by using that envelope in front of you, or by using that automatic transfer. If you want to read the Bible without fear or frustration, which is our goal for all time, but especially as we begin this new journey called the Bible Project 2020, you probably heard about it last week if you were in worship. If you missed it, you can go online and hear McGray's sermon about that or read last week's midweek message or stay tuned for exciting uh, new details of that. But we are very excited that together as the community of faith, we will read the Bible cover to cover and ponder 
the truth and the messages that are there for us. If you want to invite someone to experience God's love this week, you might consider picking up an extra one of these stress balls for your own self, but especially to offer it to someone who's going through a difficult time. May it be a representation of your love for them and encourage them on their journey of faith. We have plenty of these available, so take one or two with you as you go. And finally, to encourage you in your prayer life, um, I want to invite you to a time of prayer. And we're going to use a model of prayer today called body prayer, which you can use throughout the week as well. It involves focusing on your body, planting your feet on the ground, putting your palms up or down, whatever is most natural for you, and focusing on your body in silent reflection. It is a way of remembering that to come and see Jesus involves our whole physical selves, involves our whole bodies. So friends, would you get comfortable, put your feet on the ground, assume this posture of prayer. As you sit in this posture of prayer, notice how your body feels, how your feet feel in your shoes, how your skin, the skin of your hands, feels against the cloth or perhaps the air, how your knees feel, are they bent or crossed? Are your shoulders tight or do your arms extend loosely? Are your eyes tired or are they completely relaxed? And so with your eyes opened or closed, take a deep breath in and let it out. For some of us, this may be uncomfortable. We may not be used to a total awareness of our bodies, and that's okay. For as we pray, just breathe the breath of inspiration in and feel the Holy Spirit's presence among us. God of grace and beauty, we thank you for our lives and for our bodies. You gave us these beautiful bodies. Help us to appreciate them and to treat them well. And help us to use our whole selves to worship you in all that we do. This we pray together in silence. O oh God of healing and wholeness, this day, we ask that you would be with those who suffer in body, in mind, and spirit. Help them feel your presence. Help them see the healing touch of your grace on their lives this day. Especially right now, we lift up Betty and her family. We lift up Mary Jane and Dan. We remember Bill and Ann and Merrick and so many others, God, who are on our hearts and in our minds. For these friends, we pray in silence. O oh God of peace and justice, we pray that you would enter those places of trouble in this world, like the volatile Middle East, like the European Union and its future. And like these United States. Yes, God, guide the leaders of every land 
that they may share in your good purpose for our entire world. For all the broken places, we pray in silence. God of inclusion and compassion, help us all to be agents of love in your world, that everyone could be directed to your goodness and feel invited to come and see just how beautiful a relationship with you is. Oh God, there's so much we pray about this day. And all of it we lift up to you in the strong and healing name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I would invite the ushers to come forward as we receive our tithes, our offerings, and our gifts.